with when we talk. And yeah, like that. Yeah. 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 yeah, we can't control that anyway. We're not the one that controls her. Okay. Okay, so we're live, guys. So hello, everyone, and welcome to this new episode of the TOT Doctors Roundtable. So if you haven't already, please subscribe by hitting that red button and the notification bell so you won't miss anything. And today we have on our panel Dr. Keith Nichols from the United States and from the UK, Sam Cook and Mike Coxis from Balance My Hormones UK. So how are you guys? Good, good. How are you? Thanks, Stephen. Yeah, thanks. Welcome. Welcome. So these guys, together with many others, are in our closed and free Facebook group, TRT and Hormone Optimization Therapy, HOT. And if you're watching this, you surely must be interested. And if you haven't already, please join that group as well. You will find the link under the video. First, we will have a couple of prepared questions for our panel. And afterwards, we will take your questions from the Q&A live stream chat box. So, okay. So... First, Sam and Mike, maybe explain shortly to our viewers and to Keith what yeah. you and Balance My Hormones exactly do in the world of hormone optimization. All right, well, thanks for that. Well, first of all, I, I set this up three years ago because there was a dire need in, in Europe and the UK to help men and women get access to hormone treatments. And it was very restrictive going through the NHS, especially my experiences um, living in America and then coming and, and experiencing the NHS firsthand it was very limiting and they wanted to change my treatment protocol. It was just, just very frustrating all around. And so I thought there's got to be a better way to help people, men and, and women, but particularly men, get access to you know, hormone treatment doctors that were clued up and were, were willing and able to offer more of an American style TRT with British and European sensibilities, I like to say. Essentially putting the pieces together, what's available in, in America with the best of what we've got here in Britain and Europe. So that, that's what we actually do is provide support um, and a network of doctors uh, and guiding patients through the entire process. We connect them with the pharmacy, uh, with our laboratories and, and with uh, cleared up doctors in the area of TRT throughout the UK and Europe. Yeah, and the support element as well is obviously key. You know, I've got a sort of a service of ongoing, you know, non-medical advice support, sort of patient to patient type advocate um, for sort of more of that side of things as well. Yeah. So you bring together the patients, the doctors, the pharmacies and the laboratories. Yeah. So we're a big support uh, platform for everyone coming together um, in a seamless way. And so when they come to balance for hormones, you know, we've found the doctors that, that are clued up, that know about TRT and, and are able to, to be very open-minded compared to the closed-mindedness of, of the typical NHS doctors who are very much uh, deliberately or um, just by chance uh, restrictive on, on TRT. Uh, usually they won't start men on TRT until their levels are um, about six nanomolars per litre in many cases, which I think is around 200 nanograms per decilitre mm. or even a little bit lower before they'll even consider TRT despite symptoms. So, you know, our job, our role is to, to help let patients know what it's like as another patient who's gone through it before them. So it takes a lot of the worry out of it. And it also helps the doctors um, uh, see patients uh, probably more efficiently and it makes the consultations more effective. Yeah. Okay, Keith, this kind of service doesn't uh, exist in the United States or is there any need for it? Uh, well, you know, a lot of clinics are set up. You know, we deal with our own compounding pharmacies or at least some trusted pharmacies. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's set up very similar, very similar. Okay. So let's talk about some differences. Uh, that's why we bring you guys together between the US, maybe Canada as well, uh, and the UK way of working. So first, the creams, because we both use them. And I understand Keith likes to use the 20% cream in a two-click system, and that delivers 50 milligrams per click. So they can dose up and down in clicks uh, as needed. And in the UK, I understand they use different uh, concentrations of the same cream, but Maybe can you each explain why you prefer this way of working? Maybe first, UK, explain about these uh, concentrations. Uh. In, in the UK, we've got different different pumps. And I think we're talking about the same things, more or less. The, the types of pumps that we have, the, the, uh, the amount per pump, the volume per pump can differ. So in general, the, the pumps that are more standard are um, usually half a milliliter. 
uh, or half, half, a, half a gram. Yeah. But yeah. more importantly, we, the, the pharmacy, the doctor can, can make any concentration they want, even matching it up to what, what the Americans do. It's just the doctors that, um, um, that, that work with us prefer doing it uh, in the way that they do it. And the, the percentage um, of measurement is just, it's a different way. We, we, it's, the, it's the pharmacy, isn't it? I mean, yeah, the we, pharmacy makes it up. As, they like to use the language and calculation of per pump dosage. Whereas the, you know, you're, if you're using a 20% cream, Keith, and then you were to do smaller volumes, then that gives you that titration, I'm sure, of the different, uh, like, like 50 milligrams, you could then, you know, titrate it up and down. The pharmacies can make the same percentage creams. It's just the dosage in terms of size of click. So, you know, you could make a, a 50 milligram, you know, per pump or a 25 or a, you can titrate and it can be made into any concentration. So I think, I think we're actually talking from, from what you were probably telling me maybe different in a minute, but I think we're talking about the same thing. I think it's just the pharmacy language that's, that's maybe slightly different because they don't, don't like to use a percentage. They like to use a dose per the actual volume of, of pump. So sense. when our doctors originally gave them the percentage, the pharmacy just converted into per pump uh, concentration, which essentially gave us the same thing. But there's a possibility to make it a, any concentration. But then you would need uh, another kind of pump if you want to change the dose, because you always get the same dose per pump. Well, you can do this. You can add more pumps. So we could order uh, the, the topic click that you just twist and make it, but you're still excreting a certain amount. So this is at the same size every time. Um, so and you, you could start with, you can start uh, with 50 one pump. or a 25 per pump and then you know you could titrate out and use your blood testing and 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 sort of work with that until maybe you then know what your what your dosage is and it can be changed by the pharmacy that it's one pump that is now your dosage if that makes sense when you're up and running um so it's just the container it seems that that that, that is there i mean the topic click seems quite useful uh, in that way mm -hmm. keith what's your experience well you can use various uh delivery methods here in the US too. You could use a tube where the patient actually measures it out himself. Yeah. Uh, we, can, we can use pumps as well. There are different topic clicks where they will dispense a half an ML uh, per click. But we particularly use, I particularly use the, uh, the topic click where it dispenses a quarter of an ML per click. Yes, I use uh, 200 milligrams per gram uh, in, in males. And the reason that is, it's, uh, is that it's time and money. The, the patient's time and the, and the patient's money. And what I mean by that is that by dispensing 200 milligrams per gram, let's say they have to use uh, 100 milligrams a day. So that's gonna be two clicks out of the top of clicks. So it's 50 milligrams per click. And let's say they do that twice a day. Most of my patients are on twice a day uh, applications. So one top of, top of click two, which is 30 mLs, is gonna last 30 days, one month, all right? So that's in a 200 milligram per gram concentration. If we use 100 milligrams per ml or gram, then the problem is, is they have to use twice as much to get the same effect, so it costs them twice as much. One topic click here, for instance, at the national pharmacy we use is $47 per topic click too. So, uh, so if I used 100, so if, when they use a 100 milligram concentration, it, yes, we can get the same results, you just have to use twice as much. So in a pump that dispenses one half ml, and it's 100 milligram per ml solution, concentration it is, so each pump is gonna be a half an ml, it's gonna be 50, it's gonna be 50 uh, uh, milligrams. So they will use one total ml every morning and afternoon to get 100 milligrams, right? So it's two pumps, so that's gonna be a full ml. Whereas my concentration of 200 milligrams per ml I'll do two clicks, which is half an ml. So they have to use a full ml. I'm using half an ml. We're getting the same results, but the patient has to pay less because it's only going to cost him forty-seven dollars a month versus ninety over ninety dollars a month. So that's really the only difference. That's, so, can yes. so can I compound it to different concentrations? Sure, especially with women. Once you find a woman's dose, you can compound it in such a way that that tube will last her three and four months. Um, men, unfortunately, the most you can compound it in is 200 milligrams per gram. And any good compounding pharmacy will tell you this. It doesn't matter whether it's testosterone or some people want to uh, 
formulate pregnenolone mixed with DHEA and, and, a, and, a, and use it transdermally. It doesn't matter what you mix up in there. Your concentration is limited to 200 milligrams per, per uh, ml because anything after that will, will precipitate out and crystallize. If you ever apply a cream and it feels gritty, it's crystallized, it's not any good. So I would just, you know, it needs to go in, needs to be rapidly absorbed for it to be a good cream. So bottom line is we can use a lot of different tubes. We can make it in every different concentration known to man, uh, for the most part, up to 200 milligrams per gram. Uh, but I do it particularly to save the patient money, just to save them money. Makes sense. Just for the record, the, the pumps, I believe, are half a milliliter as well. So there's a titrate, titration, a titration for those are possible. So it's, it's um, you know, it's, it's more or less, we, we mostly match up. Yeah. Well, you, you match up, but you have to use twice as much if you use 100 milligram per ml. You match but, up, but you still have to use twice as much. I could also uh, do 100 milligrams per ml. I still have to apply one half ml. Each pump is one half ml and 100 milligrams per ml. So each pump is going to be 50 milligrams. So you have to use one full ml to get 100 milligrams, whereas I only have to, you know, I don't have to use that much. You have to use, you know, a lot. You have to use a whole ML to get 100 milligrams. I only have to use a half an ML to get 100 milligrams. That's the only difference. If Actually, if half, take money, half a mil gives us 100 milligrams. If it's no, those. an ML, your pump is half an ML. It's a half an ML. Pump. Yeah, right. So, okay. Right. So, but it can be, it can go up and it can go down. Hmm. All right. Um, Mike so, so and if Sam. You, if you, so, uh, if you went up to 200 milligrams per ML, your patients would pay half as much per month to get their same dosage. Mm -hmm. Mike and Sam, you sent me a tube. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that was also uh, 0 0.5 milliliters per pump, and it provided 150 milligrams. Yes. So that would be 30%. And yeah. Keith says that's impossible, 30%. You can put it in there and say you've got it, but it's not going to last and it's not going to be absorbed as well. That's the problem is you got to speak with a compounder that knows how to compound. And so we've got some very good compounding pharmacies here in the U.S. Uh, MedQuest is one good one, but it's 20 percent is as much as you can if you can stuff in there and get good absorption without it crystallizing out. Stephen, has yours crystallized out? You seem to get no. So I, I think I think what we're running into here is almost the difference between the SI units on the lab ranges and the American ranges. I think more or less we're we're on the same some, same pathway, Keith, as as you. Well, I would ask Stephen if he read the pump correctly. Is it 150 per ml? That would be 300 milligrams per ml. Yes, that's what it says. Is it, is it, does it say, or is it actually 75 per pump to get 150? It says 150 milligrams per pump. Well, yeah, I'd like to see the, just look at the lab values on that. I've, I can't tell you how many pharmacies I've spoken to, and they said that it's just not going to last. It'll become essentially very glue-like material over a period of time, won't have a, a long shelf life, but then number two, it's going to crystallize out. So it'll be interesting to, uh, to see how that, that pans out. We've got a master formulator at the pharmacy. <laughs> I, I would say so. I would say so. We need to, we need to talk with him. Yeah, well, well, yeah, it means, you know, like with that dose, I mean, we've not really had any, anybody complain of that, so. I mean, we, we didn't want to um, go into the nitty gritty of, of all, all the details because we thought it might be a bit confusing going into great detail. We too want to save our clients money and time. And so, I mean, there's, I think we do it differently here is that, you know, everyone has a treatment plan and the doctor prescribes a treatment plan and they have a essentially monthly subscription and they get things included uh, as far as their, uh, the, the cost of the cream. So it, it you know, from, from a cost point of view, we always want to make this a sustainable proposition for our clients. This is something they're on for life. And, um, you know, at, at the end of the day, it's, it's what the doctor decides is best for, for the, each individual patient. And we um, always love to hear what our American friends think about uh, the, the best practices and our doctors very much take that on board. But like, we, we can speak to the pharmacies, as like I said, and if there's anything, you know, comparing, Keith, if there's something that, you know, is, is being, diff you know, done differently, obviously we can have a chat about it and see, find out. Yeah, we should contact uh, those pharmacies uh, <laughs> and, and, yeah, exchange the formulations, whatever. Certainly. But at the end of the day, we, we're seeing really good blood levels on trough or 12 hours later, depending on how, how the dosages are. Um, you test. Have you done the blood testing? 
yes, I got the exact same levels from the UK cream as I got from the Belgian cream. That was exact what Keith prescribed, 20% in the topic click system. I got the same level, so... Uh, it must be working anyway. <laughs> Maybe you just, you just got a great scrotum, Steve. Maybe. <laughs> I have no idea. I can't compare it. <laughs> so. Okay, let's shift to injections, guys. Uh, okay, so more and more in the US um, and Canada, uh, Northern America, uh, they are switching towards subcutaneous injections. Uh, Danny Bossa, who is uh, chatting away uh, and uh, answering other questions in the chat box, uh, uh, is also always telling me about subcutaneous injections that he is doing daily. So, But I understand with the preparations in Europe, uh, we cannot seem to do that without getting problems like subcutaneous nodules. So. Why this difference? Uh, first, maybe explain once again, you already uh, explained it in another video to me, uh, Mike and Sam, but explain it here once again. What's the problem uh, in Europe? So usually some, some of the formulations like Sosnon are quite a thick oil. They use Arrakis oil, which is a peanut-based oil. Um, it could possibly be the Arrakis oil, but we've also seen it with other oils like castor oil that was used in the Nantfate uh, as well. And what we found, it, we get the complaints the, to the doctor about oh, do I have a lump? Do I have an abscess? What's going on? And normally they'll, they'll admit that either the, the wives injected, uh, they made it too shallow, the injection, uh, or as they were pulling up, it got into a subcutaneous region and they would complain of a golf ball size lump. When, when people are doing intramuscular. When they're doing yeah, intramuscular, yeah. falling short of intramuscular, they would complain of lumps and bumps. And, and likewise, we've had patients that would do a subcutaneous into the abdomen um, and, and complain of lumps and bumps and bruising and swelling. I mean, I personally use testosterone cypionate. And I personally tried it a few times. Uh, the American preparations are commercially prepared ones, not the ones from a compounding pharmacist. And, and I find also I'd, I'd get bruising from time to time from doing it. So I suppose it's where, where you would inject it subcutaneously. But uh, the final reason why the, it's not preferred is because um, it's an off-label off use of, of the testosterone here. They come in ampules. And to do a, a tiny little subcutaneous injection, you'd use a fraction of this and have to discard the rest of it because there's no safe way to store this. Uh, you know, you can't store a syringe. You can't preload a syringe or backfill a syringe. I think it's scary for doctors. You know, doctors are really, you know, the light is shone upon them with what they're doing and monitored really closely. And I think if, you know, that would be a classic thing. Like this, the inner, the, the package inner says you're supposed to do this intramuscular and this patient's complained because they've got this, this sort of lump and, it, and it, you know, potentially what they would call an infection or something like that, you know? Um, so I don't know, Keith, you found that, cause obviously you have your compounding pharmacies in the U S is there like a specific oil that's, cause I, I wonder whether it's just something in the formulation that's, that's ag aggravating. Um, well, we use, I usually use a, a pharmaceutical grade. I don't, uh, I'm not using right now a compounding pharmacy for my injectables, the, okay. the major, uh, so I, I don't really have it compounded. A lot of guys are compounded in grapeseed oil. And, you know, mm, uh, absolutely. So I've not run into any problems on my guys that inject. Of course, they're in, injecting cypionate. They're doing it subcutaneously. And we at least have a lot of studies out there now to show that subcutaneous can be just as good, if not maybe better for some, using less dose and being less painful. No, no chance of scar tissue in the muscle. So we at least aren't running into that. I feel bad for your guys over there that they're running into it. Uh, I know we don't use propionate anymore, but I know a lot of guys can get a lot of pain, you know, and inflammation at that injection site. I think, Stephen, you're one of those, right? Exactly. But well, the propionate is in the system, and that gave yeah. me the subcutaneous nodules as well. But I've heard a lot of people, uh, even Belgians that contacted me uh, online, that uh, ordered um, from Rotex Medica, that's in, in Germany, um, testosterone enantate. I don't know in which oil, but they get problems where they, and they inject that subcutaneously as well. So I don't know why that is. Where are your patients injecting uh, subcutaneous? Uh, are they doing it uh, in, in the abdomen? Keith? Yeah, in yeah. the ab abdomen, a lot of them. Yeah. I'll alternate sides, abdomen. And I'm, I'm, let me, I kind of misspoke. We do actually use, I use uh, MedQuest uh, as a national pharmacy. And of course, Empower is a big pharmacy here that we utilize for injections. They do compound their testosterone. Okay. So then it's probably lighter oil, maybe an ethyl oleate yeah. or grape seed. Yeah. You need every in Europe to just try subcutaneous and just try to figure out. The other, the other problem, Keith, is you know, just, you know they come in these, these glass ampules. Yeah. Like we said, it's, it's a bit wasteful. I, I mean, as it is, you know, if the doctor's using a fraction of the dose or half the dose, um, it, they tell them to discard the other half because they, they can't really legally tell the patient to store it in the syringe or 
you know, put in a vial or whatever, because they just don't sell them here. And it, it would put the doctor in great risk if, if he did something like that. So what do you guys have to use there? What are, what are your injectables that are available now? Well, sosanon is the most cost-effective uh, wow. t- t- testosterone available, and there is testosterone and amphate. And then, you know, sometimes they have to be imported, especially if you had cypionate or propionate. But um, there's quite an expensive cost for an anthate unless it gets imported. And usually the uh, medicines agency won't allow doctors to import just based on cost. So there has to be a valid reason for importing an unlicensed product. We're in the dark ages, basically. <laughs> so, which is why we said we have to do American style TRT, but with some British sensibilities and what was available and what can be done here. Yeah. which is disappointing. We don't have peptides. We don't have, um, you know, the multi-dose vials of the MHRA throughout Europe and, and the UK don't want multi-dose vials. No. Right. So, no. How, how a, yeah. so how are you guys having them uh, di- uh, d- d- dose their sustenance? Uh, how frequently are you doing the injections? Uh, there's not a one size fits all. Every doctor has a slight different plan. I mean, some some doctors will have um, have them use half of an ampule once every five days, once a week, every three days, so, oh, 0.3 of it, so maybe 80 or 60 milligrams. Some people will have to take a little less and unfortunately discard the, the rest of it. It, it. But it has to be a real fine balance between cost, efficacy, and convenience for the patient because the patient doesn't want to inject that frequently. Then um, really the best option for them is, is, is a cream, especially the low SHGB people that seem to be with hyper excretors and, yeah. uh, and the ones that would be more sensitive to major fluctuations. The, the creams are godsend for those patients. Um, I think unfortunately people still think of these creams as like the comparison to, you know, the branded, you know, testosterone, those sorts of things. And then when, when they, they, they may start on injections and, and really be averse to it and then end up on the cream and like, oh, this works perfectly. You know, people don't really have too much of an issue with the, you know, the twice a day sort of dosing, once a day dosing sometimes, you know, it's, um, so yeah, I think it's something that actually is, is, is ends up being, if you need that more frequent dosing, it's the creams really, um, rather than the injectables. So it's just the sad truth of it really, but that's all, uh, yeah, <laughs> we're working what we have well. and uh, with the tools we have, not the tools that we want, but we, yeah. We, we have really good satisfaction from, from the different clients, the doctors, patients. Okay. I know in the US, more and more uh, HOT doctors are stopping to prescribe aromatase inhibitors uh, because blocking estrogen causes more harm than it provides any benefit. Is that the same for the UK? I know Keith was interested uh, in your answer. Yeah, so, um, look, a lot of people don't even get treatment on the NHS unless the levels are, you know, under 200. And so... And when they do treat them, it's with Nibido or uh, the commercially prepared gels. The commercially prepared gels don't even raise the levels much higher than um, where they probably start TRT treatment in America. So at those levels, the likelihood of aromatization causing any issues at all uh, would probably be very unlikely. So there would be no need. Um, I think all doctors have their own way of treating. And, and um, in the private sector, they, they tend to follow lots of the NHS guidelines Overall, but some doctors, I think, look at it as a case by case basis, and we've seen a lot of reduction in in AIs. Yes. I mean, it's amazing work by by you, uh, Keith, as far as you know, making people aware that you know estrogen is important. Same thing with uh, Dr. Neil Rousier. Mm. Um, estrogen is, isn't uh, a menace for for men, but I think uh, I think our doctors try to find the right balance and, and taking more of a balanced approach. Yeah. I think it's, it's generally now, I would say, what we'd hope be be reduced across Europe and the UK and things, but, um, you know, there's still going to be that, that presence there until everyone sort of, I suppose, gets the, the information. But I think, you know, doctors, when they use them, sometimes they, they use them more as like a tool, you know, um, to sort of get someone up and running and, and sort of in, into a place where they might feel good. Believe it or not, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the patients still have, you know, anxiety about issue being too high and causing a problem, you know, um, very much like oh uh, you know is there an aromatase inhibitor i'm really worried about this i'm really really worried about this and that's, that's sort of where, where they approach the I, th- I think some of the the, the tools that the doctor may have we've seen some of the doctors use would be um, pd5 inhibitors in some cases because it kind of solves the problem of any sort of erectile function from psychosomatic issues not to mention the vasodilation and there might be some um, mitigation of, of potential estrogen issues for some men but um 
I mean, I, I Keith, when, when I first started TRT, I, I started in, in the United States um, and, you know, various doctors had me on, you know, first as an injectable enanthate when I was 22, then eventually onto the PLO cream from Dr. Krije. He calls it the, the Tesso cream. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. He worked closely with Dr. Shippen and I think he knows Mark Gordon. Um, but I, did, I used that for quite a long time. But um, you know, then uh, I went to see an endocrinologist who saw that I had elevated prolactin, ele elevated estrogen probably in the 60s, 65 picogram per milliliter range. And they put me on an anastrozole, the endocrinologist, uh, a milligram a day. Now I'm happy to say, I mean, over the years, I went on less and less and less. Um, and, and, and now a, day. <laughs> a milligram a day. And then every other day. And then now it's none at all. So it's... Um, you know, it's, again, it's really important to get the message out there that if you don't need an AI, um, it's preferable that you don't. And all we can do is help educate those uh, that there are, you know, there are options if you want to wean off an AI that that can be helped. But it's not our call. At the end of the day, it's the doctor. It's, it's, and, it's, it's, yeah. like it's not even enough education on just doing uh, or just having the TRC available for people and diagnosing them with, with a, a, low, a low enough level of the symptoms and actually getting them on some sort of therapy. It's almost like that would be like, well, you think it will come together, but it's probably like stage two, you mm -hmm. know? It probably might, if someone's starting it, you know, I can imagine a doctor might be like, well, what about all of this estrogen? And then they yeah. would need that secondary education. They, the doctors ask that the estrogen's tested. Normally, especially at the beginning, because if the estrogen's very low, and we know, uh, unfortunately, with the test that diagnostics, the uh, radio amino assay test always overstate the amount of estrogen. So if the estrogen is... Um, I can't, I can't think of the American conversion, but it's, it, and here it's like the 60 or 80 um, picomolar per liter, which would be um, just under, I think, 20 uh, on the American scale. Then, you know, if they're really low when they start TRT treatment, even if things look maybe average for the total testosterone, that well, actually, they're not getting enough aromatization, not enough estradiol. The doctor may say, well, this is another case in point why perhaps TRT is going to be the option for you because your estradiol is too low. So having that on, on the test, I think, helps the doctor with uh, his diagnosis. Any comments or questions for them, uh, Keith? No, no. I, was, I, too, was on an AI when I first started as well. I didn't stop until 2013 when somebody smarter than me, uh, my wife, uh, <laughs> stop. So, so she was, uh, once again, she, uh, she pointed out that I was following the evidence-based medicine yes. everywhere but that because I couldn't break that bro science, you know, mentality, you know, I, I, that belief perseverance, we'll call it. But, uh, and I had all the estrogen symptoms you had, you know, bloating or itchy nipple, whatever. And when I would take the AI, two or three days later, it'd get better. I show my patients my labs in the office and I could show them where I could maintain my estrogen levels perfectly within 20 to 30, better than anybody. And I show them the labs where I would get, you know, a little bloated or whatever. And I would take my AI, more AI that is, and I drop it down to single digits, never crash my estrogen stuff per se, but I would drop it down to single digits. You can see it on my lab work. And then finally, when she made me stop, thank God, uh, I did measure it and showed it that when it now it presently last time I measured it was 79.6 and I couldn't be doing any better. And it's funny how those estrogen symptoms just go away uh, when you're, when you learn how beneficial it is versus learning to fear it. I mean, you know, you fear what you learn to fear. You get what you, what you're taught you're going to get. And so once you uh, learn the benefits, it's funny how, how things just change and they, they really couldn't have been any better. So I, I no longer block it, nor do I block it in my patients, nor do I measure it in my patients. Okay. Interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, hey. Have you heard of uh, aromatase um, of um, PD five inhibitors ever having a real you know, effect? I've just heard anecdotal reports of guys that have gone up to like you know ten milligrams a day of, of like Cialis, like dropping estrogen. Have you have you have you ever heard of that? Of dropping dropping estrogen. Oh, dropping their estrogen. Well, since I don't measure it, I wouldn't know. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, but, I, but I do give all my my patients the opportunity to be on a on, you know daily Cialis if they would like for the for the health benefits, and so I uh, do that as a courtesy in addition to their their you know hormones. Yeah, it's very synergistic. Uh, I mean, for me, the 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 point of recognition that you know, maybe there was too much AI was a combination. I started the thyroid treatment. Um, I was using Tadalafil, and um, at the time I had had an, uh, was on a little bit of an AI. Uh, and, um, you know, it felt like when I was having sex, I had 10 condoms on when I mm -hmm. 
and it was just really uncomfortable. Not uncomfortable, just it wasn't working. I thought, what's going on? And I happened to have the blood test done earlier that day. When I got the lab report back, I did my yeast result was too low. And so, I mean, that's what I realized. It's like, well, actually, there, there could be some benefit for, you know, major reduction or stopping of, of the AI. But found, finding that the essentially the Tadalda field was kind of acting as one in, in, a, in a different way, probably more beneficial to uh, the vascular system anyway. I think I saw a study on it being acting on the aromatase enzyme as well. I'd have to have a look at it again. But, um, that was interesting. But mine now stays at 120, not, not the American scale. So that's probably 35, 40 on, on the uh, USA scale. So it's fine. I feel fine. Um, I wouldn't say it's been uh, um, substantially bad. It wasn't bad before, but I just think it, um, and it hasn't raised my HDL much. So. Um, we'll wait and see, but it's been nearly a year, so about eight, nine months without. So. Funny, funny thing on the lipid profile, when you look at women, where we give it back to them after they've gone through menopause, the beneficial effect on the lipids occurs really after you get 60 or more. So, you know, you may see a little blip with what you've got because testosterone will improve that lipid profile. It'll take about a year at least to start seeing that improvement. But, uh, but when it gets a little higher than that, at 60 or more, You'll, uh, you'll start seeing more beneficial effects on your on your lipid profile. Uh, interestingly enough, some uh, physicians here in the U.S. that have you know familiar hyperlipidemia, they are actually taking oral estradiol in addition to their testosterone replacement uh, for for a uh, to to improve their lipid parameters. My, my lipids always sat well, not always, but in recent years, probably way above 200, 240. Um, until I started thyroid treatment, and now they've dropped down to about 140, 150 on the total on the LDL, um, well below three on the UK scale, um, well below 100. I can't, what's the, the, the best place for it to be in the, U, in the US for LDL? Less than 100. Less, so it's less than 100 my LDL now. Where well, you want to be for your HDL? Oh, and that's the that's You want to be about 50. You want to be about so you want to be above 50 on your HDL for sure. Yeah, mine's just hovering under about 38, 37, I think the conversion is, which needs some work. But, you know, it's, uh, I think the risk factor is minimized a bit more on the LDL. I think with the Torsetrib studies, it showed that whilst you can artificially raise HDL, it didn't seem to have a benefit on uh, life extension or, or stopping cardiovascular events. I think people in this study died, so they, they halted the study. Um, for torso trip, that HDL booster back, I think it was rather. The drug was going to boost. Oh, yeah. HDL. Yeah. Do you remember that one, Keith, that was coming out? Um, the torso trip, I think it was from, from Pfizer. They pulled it from the market because it didn't really, uh, it boosted HDL very well on paper, but at the end of the day, people are dying from the, I forget what, but they just took a few deaths and they stopped the study. Yeah. Well, how, Mike, when you started the, uh, the thyroid, uh, how much weight did you lose that went along with that HDL? I mean, that, uh, yeah, that's true. Is it the thyroid? That visceral body fat. How much decrease did you have in that? Uh, yeah. I, I, you know, so I lost yeah. about eight or nine kilos. Yeah. Well, that, that, that tells you right there, you know, I mean, thyroid, <laughs> testosterone decrease that visceral body fat and down goes your cholesterol. Yeah. No, it's, um, it's good though. Yeah. It's, um, I feel like we're in the right place. So it took a while to get everything in check for years on TRT and very recently on thyroid. And maybe I should have been on it earlier. Like my eyebrows could use a bit more work to coming back there. That was the other thing we noticed with thyroid hormones makes, yeah. makes a big difference. Um, but you know, back probably eight, nine months ago, I didn't have all my eyebrows, just a little bit in the corners. And, um, I, I've seen it, Sam's seen it grow over time. So, yeah, yeah. so I, I know it's probably not the best way to just measure it, but it's obviously an outcome that's, that's, well, that weight might loss represent. Is quite good yeah, weight loss is a good measure as well. Yeah. Yeah, that was one of the questions of the guys in uh, our Facebook group as well. Any thoughts on differences between thyroid treatments and adrenal treatments in the UK versus uh, the USA? Um, I don't know how we can answer that. Uh, Keith, well, maybe start. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know how Mike and uh, Mike and Sam. How do you how do you manage it there? I mean, I'd love to hear hear your how you manage it. I mean, I've been. It's interesting to see your limitations that you have to work with. Well, this all we've got a few doctors that are, are aware and, and have helped patients with um, with adrenal issues. In particular, one of our doctors prefers to help with DHEA. Uh, to start them off on, on DHEA. Is it, or is it? We're talking just about the adrenal side take, of it, but, but I mean the. I suppose, you know, the doctors that deal with that, it's very much, it's good. I mean, you, know, you may agree with some of this as well, but it's very holistic in terms of the, 
the stresses, if there is something, you know, men- mentally, what's going on socially. Um, DHEA um, is quite a favourite, you know, a pregnant alone. Um, and some of the, you know, talked about um, ashwagandha, things like that, some of the adaptogens sometimes as well. And in some cases, you know, oral hydrocortisone, you know, small amounts. Um, but it's not really a common thing that you would, you would see. It, it tends to be if you've got like a thyroid issue going on trying to just support the adrenals in some way whilst that's corrected and then um you know things usually come back into alignment but what being what's available is is dhea there is pregnenolone but it's not over you know it's not over the counter we can't you know when we went to america we went, we went to one of the uh supplement shops and just stocks up you know um the, you know there, there is ashwagandha there is there are there are those sort of adaptogenic sort of herbs and things um I mean, thyroid treatment-wise, you know, the, 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 there is obviously the T4-based, you know, only type medications. There is, you can get T3, either, either like compounded But that's or, a bit of a controversy in the NHS around mm, T3. The NHS, because of budget, and they haven't negotiated a good price, they're trying to convince all the, the GPs or the endocrinologists not to prescribe it, saying it may cause, um, you know, heart, heart issues, uh, I think that's atrial good. fibrillation. Yeah. And they try to stop people who are already on the T3 treatment from getting it on the NHS. So they've they've actually done that. So we always have to work within what's available in for the most people within the national health service. And, and very much that is people with TSHs of, you know, over 10 are not being considered for an assessment by an endocrinologist for even anything, um, you know, uh, you know, with regards to thyroid, because the thyroid is not dead yet. You know, it's, 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 it's that sort of, you know, reasoning behind it. Whereas, you know, you have got the, you know, obviously doctors that, that, are, that you know, like doctors that, that, that sort of work with balance my hormones and that, that, that do have that awareness. But, the, you know, in the NHS, for example, T3 is by the, 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 the supplier is really expensive. So over the years, there have been some patients that started off on, you know, T4 based medications and then um, what, you know, for, with clinical reasoning, whatever, they decided to put them on some T3 and they've now set up clinics to put people back on T4 for, but for no reason, just because of cost. But they're saying, oh, we just need to get you back on T4 because, you know, there's lots of stuff coming out of T3 is dangerous and things like that. So those patients that have been through the mill and that whole journey, because that journey to get on T3 isn't, isn't a month in the NHS. It can be literally years. And now that, you know, they're popping them back onto T4 that didn't work for them in the first place. Um, and, you know, the studies show, don't they, that T4 medication doesn't work for a lot of people you've got conversion issues, you know, high reverse T3 and things like that, maybe from underlying conditions, but so there's not much available in the NHS. I mean, there's no, a big battle but, but privately on. there's a um, combination of uh, synthetic T3 and T4, uh, as well as they, they can import uh, the nature of thyroids, the WP thyroid, um, the armor thyroid, the desiccated ones as well. Um, I think those patients that have uh, Hashimoto's don't tend to, get the desiccated ones unless they've removed all gluten and dairy from the diet, but uh, it just... Mm, that just seems to be what the doctors prefer is to stay away from those ones if somebody has an autoimmune type presentation, but um, that's, that's pretty much what we've got. Yeah. I mean, I'm on a combination, two, three, two, four, mm. and it's made a world of difference. So yeah. some people, some of the clients that can benefit from it. We, uh, we, we say that, like that, that sounds like a big list, but to actually... To, to, to achieve, you know, a doctor prescribing that for you is actually a big challenge. Uh, wow. so, yeah. Because what happens is the, the regulators come and they look at the doctor and say, you're just using this for weight loss. I was like, are you kidding me? These people are suffering, you know, mm-hmm. losing their eyebrows, having high cholesterol, depression, visceral uh, fat. Visceral fat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, and, and so they're just they're stranded without any help and any lifeline. And so there's extra pressure on the private doctor um, because, you know, one, what are you doing private practice? How dare you, you know, set up a business with the NHS? And they try to hold them to the same uh, um, standard as, as the NHS when the private standard is a lot better. It's actually superior. It's not based on just cost. And that's the thing people need to realize. They've got these things called nice guidelines, and they're not very nice because what they, what they tend to do is say, well, we're only going to match the efficacy versus cost and if it's too costly, despite it being efficacious in America or other places, we're not going to prove it. You won't get it. And so that's really cruel. And it's sort of a healthcare rationing situation. And by the way, if you're a private doctor, you're not going to give it to your patients either, unless you can give us really strong evidence and it can't come from America. 
So if a doctor has to defend himself, he's very limited in bringing in witnesses from America that have to be within the UK, which is really medieval medicine at, at, at the highest point. I think they're restricted in using the most up-to-date evidence internationally. I think that's what so, happens. Yeah, so, I, yeah. Don't, so how would you like to work for the NHS, Keith? Don't, don't come <laughs> work. Yeah. terrible, man. It sounds terrible. I, never, I, I had no idea. I really had no idea. I mean, we, we face our own you know, restrictions here and it's getting to be more and more restrictive as, as you know, guys, you know, being yeah. suspended on the boards or, you know, being sued, being turned in by pharmacists, other physicians or using thyroid and testosterone thyroid. You know, if you want to uh, have a problem with a person's family physician, prescribe thyroid. Right. Yeah. This perception that it, that it causes the sequela of Graves disease, which it doesn't, there's enough studies out there to show that they're not the same. Raising someone's thyroid levels exogenously does not, equate to what happens when it's raised endogenously yeah. with the Graves disease, but, but they don't seem to know this, uh, but it's, it's there in the medical literature and it's their own medical literature. But once again, it is not much different here in the U S we can still do it, but I see the day coming. There's some, uh, there's some dark days ahead of us in uh, HRT here in the U S as well. Uh, you're, you're starting to see a, a, an underground swell of, uh, of, of, let's see what's the best way to put it. Uh, you're about to see an, an attack on HRT again here in the U.S. Mm. I've seen it in, like, you know, in some of the uh, the, the news articles mm -hmm. coming out mm -hmm. in the U.S. as well. Oh, I could see that, yeah. It's unfortunate because the U.S. has led the way for a long time on TRT and the rest of the world tends to look to the U.S. Well, mm. you know, if the Americans are doing it, then it must be good. Um, and that's somewhat of the, of the thought here in Europe. But then some of the doctors say, oh, well, Americans are cowboys, therefore we can't do it if the Americans are doing it. So it kind of cuts both ways. Yes, it does. Right. Well, you've guys got some serious limitations there, but you're certainly doing a good job of what you got to work with. So Thank you. We, we, it's very rewarding every day when you can help people and, and get them access to this um, you know, safely, effectively. Um, you know, it changes people's lives and, and they're so thankful for it. So and we're thankful to be able to help them. Definitely. Okay, let's talk about expectations, Keith. How do you deal with men's expectations when starting them up on uh, hormone optimization? I know a lot of men have unrealistic expectations or are way too impatient. So yeah. uh, what do you have to say about that? I can't wait to hear Sam and Mike on this, but, I, but I'll tell you, that's one of the most difficult parts of uh, being a provider with regard to hormone replacement therapy and is that, uh, you know, I'll tell you the number one reason that men and women stop their hormones, you know, worldwide is because they didn't get the results they wanted in the time frame they expected. They're expecting these results in a certain time frame when they don't get it, something must be wrong. It doesn't work. Uh, so you look at these guys and they want to, you know, feel great, but you want to have it in a short period of time. And when you ask them what really feeling great is, you'll find that their, their uh, definition of great is an unrealistic ex expectation with regard to testosterone. They think that they're never going to be fatigued, never be tired, never have a morning without an erection. They're going to be able to have sex two or three times a day on command. Uh, they're going to go to the gym and work out like they're on anabolic steroids. They're going to go home and sleep like a baby, get up and repeat day after day after day. I literally used to get emails and phone calls about, hey, Doc, Doc Nichols, I, I've really been tired this last three to four days. You know, do you think I need to look at something, get some labs, change something? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you know, give it another week. If it's still here in two weeks, give me a call. You don't get a call back. Uh, you typically don't get a call back. But the point is, is uh, we're so conditioned that if we have one bad day that, that we just need to change something, look at a, let me check my estrogen. Let me, let me check all these parameters. And, and really, they, we've forgotten that we're all human. We have our ups and downs. And, and we're going to, we're going to have weeks throughout the year that we're going to be fatigued. You know, we're going to be tired. And, and there may not even be a, a reason you know we may not be working extra hours everything may be going great at home but but typically these guys want immediate results and they want it to happen within days or a few weeks and you try to explain to them over and over again it takes months it takes months i i think that the optimization truly is getting those testosterone levels for instance above the minimal effective concentration which is the line below which you'll have symptoms so get it above that minimal co effective concentration line and keep it there and then give it time to work which is months. Yeah. So, so that's kind of what, what we run into is those unrealistic expectations. And uh, I think, I just, sorry, sorry, Keith. No, no, please. I was just saying, I think, uh, you know, the, the forum sort of space where, where maybe, maybe a man has been suffering with multitude of the symptoms and then 
you know, for some, one of the most, and it might be anxiety, it might be the sexual dysfunction, but one of the ones that's really been affecting them the most maybe improves drastically. And then they get on the forums and they'll be like, oh, you know, I'm having sex five times a day or I just don't care about it. And then someone sees that and then, I'm, you know, they're like, well, that's what that will do for me across exactly. the um, And then they're taking that into that, that sort of expectation. It's really important, isn't it, to, to, you know, and this is what our doctors do, but also like, you know, the patient to patient type advocacy service where they've been through it as well is that, you know, they're, like you say, there are, there are things that make you fatigued. You know, life will make you fatigued. That's right. I'll tell them all the time, testosterone or your other hormones won't ever come light. If you're, if you're stressed, got a bad marriage, got a bad job, you're working two jobs, you're not getting enough sleep, for whatever reason, you're going to be tired and fatigued. You're not going to have morning erections. You're not going to feel like having sex. They're, you know, you're not going to have good workouts. It, it all goes together. And, and, and these hormones do not override that. They, did, they just don't. No, absolutely. And I think another thing is when people first start, some of them are very eager to get back into the gym, start their you know, physical training routine. And they overdo it. They might be even overtraining where the hormones can't compensate for that. And so uh, then they got to you know, dial back a bit and, and you know, give your body some, some recovery time. But you know, we've also seen, seen people, and, and most of the, the, I suppose, the complaints of it not working, I don't feel anything, happen in the first few, I'd say six weeks to, to six months. But the ones that really stay the course, you know, up to a year even, actually – you don't hear those complaints anymore. They're actually quite happy. Things are great. You ask them how they've been doing. They say, it's been fantastic. I'm really glad I did it. But you re remember back, you know, uh, six months earlier and there was a different story, but you just have to stick with it. Mike, that's a good point. That's an excellent point uh, that it really, if you look at the literature, it takes up to a year and a lot of guys quit it early. Uh, they give up on their quote protocol. I don't like that word. I don't have any protocol that I know of, but nonetheless, uh, you know, they just don't give it enough time. Uh, I think I see multiple errors made with regard to the treatment. Number one, they may not have enough. They don't, may not get enough of a dose to really get them above that minimal effective concentration. And then number two, they, they don't give it long enough to work. Yeah. And so you're right. You've got to really, I tell the guys, you got to be three to six months to start knowing something, six months to a year to really see, see the, some major benefits. And you know, you're right in that first four to six weeks, uh, if things aren't happening, they're ready to, to change something or, or measure something. And, I, and I'll tell people when you go start testosterone, I, I won't, People to understand there's three groups of men that come back to see you four to six weeks later when they first start. And if you really think about it, you got that guy that comes back and this isn't the, the, the majority of men, but it, but it does happen. You've you got a guy come back in four to six weeks after he starts and everything's, he's great. He feels great. His levels are all beautiful. He's a win. He's a winner. He he's, doesn't have to do anything else. He's just go about life and live it to the fullest. Your second, which is the most common is you got a guy that comes back. You, I mean, you have to start somebody on some dose and then adjust that dose up or down based on your results. So nonetheless, uh, the second guy will come back and he'll be better, better, but his labs will not, you know, be as good as they could be. So yeah, we'll raise that dosage a little bit and check in another four to six weeks and we'll make some adjustments. Yeah. So that's definitely the most common. Then the, the last guy, which is the most difficult to convince, but they end up always doing well. If they'll just, as you said, Mike, if they'll just hold the course and stay with the program, it's this. The guy that comes back four to six weeks later, his numbers are just gorgeous. They're beautiful. They're as good as they could ever be. They're, they're ones that you would want yourself. But yep. yet, they're not a lot better yet. That's the guy you have to say, man, you got to give it some time. You don't yep. need to adjust your dosage at all. You just need to give it some time, and it will work. And if those guys do buy into that and truly give it time, they all do better. It works in everybody. We know what it does from a physiology standpoint. We know what testosterone does. So if you just give it enough time and you get it in enough – of, a, of, an, of an amount, you'll do well. But there's also the tweakers, the ones that want to just kind of find uh, that adjustment here, adjustment there, that kind of chasing this, this, this magical unicorn in, in a way. But there's, all, there's also, the, there's some people that actually, if, if the thyroid might be a bit off, uh, which has a knock-on effect with the prolactin level being high. Um, but usually, we, I think the doctors have seen um, the, the levels of prolactin usually go high just on their own from testosterone mm -hmm. in, in quite a few of the patients mm -hmm. when the first year, six months of treatment and then usually falls back down to baseline. But every now and then it's also related to the other, uh, the hypothyroidism or mm -hmm. elevated TSH. And so um, sometimes that will also help knock out the, oh, I, I've got uh, no energy. And occasionally sometimes it's the autoimmune disease, the, the Hashimoto's, the, the mm -hmm. elevation, the antibodies that they still have the brain fog from. Uh, and that's usually something that if that could be addressed with sometimes mm -hmm. diet or again, thyroid treatment, it helps. And I agree. Yeah. 
that's a good point with regard to the thyroid. So let's get back to that for a second, because when a man comes in, a lot of the symptoms of, you know, of underactive thyroid, let's, they don't really might meet criteria for hypothyroidism. Let's just call it, uh, you know, thyroid deficiency. They're having symptoms of that. The problem is they overlap with testosterone a lot. So the dilemma comes in, uh, and a guy that has pretty decent, let's say, thyroid function tests. We're not talking about the kind of guy that comes in with a TSH of four or five. That's that's a no-brainer. But let's say he has pretty decent, but he has all these symptoms. Do you start it right off the bat, or do you get them optimal in your testosterone, see what's left over, and then start them? When it comes to men, I typically, if once again, fairly decent thyroid function studies, uh, I will start them on testosterone first, get them optimal and then see if all those symptoms resolve. If they still have a component of fatigue that, that doesn't resolve or erectile dysfunction, then I really like to optimize the thyroid in a man at that point. Some men come in, their thyroid function tests are so bad, uh, they're so fatigued, you just know you're gonna need it right off the bat, so you do start it right off the bat with them. Women are a completely different story. They're so, they're so uh, in need of their thyroid, I mean, big time, but men not so much. So how do your doctors on, on average do that in, in the UK? Because once again, I'll try to get a man optimal on his testosterone first, and then add thyroid if needed. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite literally quite that. Similar, it's the yeah. same thing. It's the, unless they're obviously really unwell, you know, and the, the doctor deems it suitable to start on both. that first. Yeah. It, but, you know, likewise, we've had a, you know, a testosterone that was sort of, you know, middle of the range, you know, symptoms, but severely hypothyroid that was treated with just thyroid. And then the, the testosterone levels came right back up. So it's absolutely, I think it's the, the doctors very much focused on minimal intervention, you know, for that, for that maximum outcome. And we do, we do, you know, I've seen the blood levels where, and the symptom resolution where it's just been testosterone and then, and then that everything else is sort of uh, thyroid wise has improved. But I think that's where the education is, is key from the doctor. And then, re, you know, we, we often have people reminding, like we say, from the, the patient support sort of aspect, but, the, um, you know, it, you, you may have some thyroid issues going on here and we're going to see if the testosterone treatment helps that. But again, that might be another, you still might have fatigue or these other bits and bobs that might need to be that secondary sort of intervention down the line. So it's a process type thing. I think that's the... I mean, some of our doctors, or really all of them, feel that lots of the cases of hypothyroidism and hypogonadism are interrelated through autoimmune disorders. Uh, for quite a few people, they just aren't being recognised or treated. Yeah. Presentations. Yeah. Well, well, Sam, I hope that people heard what you actually just said, uh, which you know it's a process, and your doctor reevaluates and addresses. But that happens with time, right? Absolutely. It's not, it's not immediate. So if people were really listening to what you had to say, you know, I'm hearing that you know we start them, we we see how they're doing, and we sometimes have to intervene and add you know, thyroid or maybe something else. And to do that, it takes time. It takes follow-up and time. And so men have to hear what you're saying is that it's not going to happen in four to six weeks for most of us. Give me four, six, 12 months for it to work. Absolutely. Yeah. But just have a physician there that's listening to you, that's addressing your symptoms. But at, at some point in time, you have to give time itself a chance to work. I think that's what they like about our support service that we also offer the patient to patient advocacy uh, and support where you can bounce ideas off of other medical case managers. Hey, what was it like when you're on treatment? And that kind of somewhat holds their hand throughout the process. Uh, so they're thinking, okay, someone's here. They're, they're re relaying this to the doctor and it's an extra set of eyes and ears uh, for the doctors. So that's get, getting even better um, information for them. Mm. Okay, we already had some questions in from the viewers. A good question from our Facebook group that is worth mentioning and uh, getting answered here. Uh, the question was, um, do we really have to worry about donating blood every few months due to higher hematocrit? So how do you go about that in the UK, Sam, uh, Mike? Yes, Sam. I, yeah, I mean, the, we don't see a lot of it, to be honest, but there are some guys that, that have it. I mean, the, the evidence is... Uh, you know, uh, that actually it's not as, as long as you're not getting a raise of like platelets and all these other things that, that are happening, it's, 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 it's not much of an issue. But in terms of what the doctors, again, how they're monitored and restricted, if, they, if someone was to see a high hematocrit in hemoglobin, you know, and, and this person, for example, I don't know, you know, experienced high blood pressure or, or, or something else, you know, that would be something that they would focus on. So I think even if the doctor, because, you know, we do have this, even if the doctor doesn't, 
again, we, they, they can't often utilize international evidence, right? You know, if they, if they have a high hematocrine hemoglobin, it's usually recommended donate a pint of blood, you know, it's a good thing to do. Maybe just do it on a, on a, on a basis and, until sort of things level out. But yeah. Well, and for those men who the NHS uh, won't draw the blood for, then the, we have a private service that we, we work with a private um, company that will draw the blood for the patient. Uh, we have like a, we have the, it's not the Red Cross, it's like the NHS give blood service. But um, they'll say if the hematocrit's too high, people can't donate. If they're on HCG, they say you can't donate. And so then that usually becomes a real problem. So we have to help arrange for the right service for them to, um, to be able to have a pint taken mm -hmm. and disposed of, which is a, is a waste really, but they don't want that in the blood supply. So I think that's the thing. I think it has to happen here basically because doctors feel like they must, um, even if they don't fully agree with the evidence behind it. I mean, I think a lot of them agree with Dr. Neil Rousseau's uh, analysis. You know, there are people in high altitudes, you know, that have just a secondary erythrocytosis, not necessarily um, polycythemia, which always gets conflated. Um, we've heard from a couple of patients that had gone to hematologists because they were a bit worried about the high hematocrine and hemoglobin, especially, you know, some that were applying for life insurance policies. And so they had to be put through the ringer through all these different tests when there was just secondary erythrocytosis to finally say, okay, you're, you're right. I mean, one hematologist told one of our clients that, all right, unless your hematocrit's 60 or 60%, you know, we don't usually worry too much. That was shocking, really, that come from an NHS hematologist. Yeah. But, um, but I mean, the other things like, you know, do you have sleep apnea? Has TRT uncovered a sleep apnea that you may have had that was mild? You know, those sort of things, obviously, uh, are, are, you know, checked as well but um so in some ways it's a good guide almost a canary in the coal mine with the with the hematocrit going up because that gives the doctor the chance to ask if there is an issue with these things and then try to get them to having a you know cpap or at least a sleep study okay keith uh, is there a certain number that you use in the us to say now it's the moment you have to draw blood i haven't run into that that yet I, you know so we, we don't really Run into that problem. Mine runs 54.7. That's what mine last time I checked it, 54.7 mm -hmm. automatically. But I think, you know, the, it's one of the beneficial effects of testosterone, the increase that oxygenation. That's why you can give it to a, a diabetic with, with ulcers and heal those ulcers. So, uh, you know, we don't bleed COPD guys. We don't bleed people at altitude. We don't, you know, bleed uh, sleep apnea people with, you know, anytime you're in a hypoxic environment, you know, you're going to compensate by increasing red blood cell mass. And, uh, but, you know, with testosterone, same way, it's just, once again, the, a lot of the doctors, and I understand why they do it, they're, they're, it's about, you know, CYA, of course it is, and that's what they're doing there, and you can't blame them for that, so they, they, they play along. Hey, the problem hey. is, is that I see a lot of guys that come in for the initial consult that have been on testosterone, and they're still extremely fatigued, um, you know, they don't, they don't feel well. And when you look at them, they're, they have iron deficiency anemia, but the testosterone levels look great, but they're losing all the benefits while bleeding themselves every month or two. And yeah. So we, yeah, I mean, I think our doctors are quite happy if they want to give blood because it's a nice thing to do. And if they give so many donations, the ones that are required by the normal blood donation centers, they get a free, I think, a special dinner at the end of the year. And it's a nice thing to do. So do the normal way. But if they're giving more therapeutic phlebotomy on a regular, regular basis, just to get it down to a certain number. And I know because I had to go through this when I... Um, when I was in, in America, one of my doctors wasn't very comfortable with where my hematocrit was, about 54, 55, around there. Mm -hmm. I think it even changed seasonally and made me go to get thera therapeutic phlebotomy from the American Red Cross. And it was just like, it's just it's strange. You. I mean, it does. It does. Uh, well, I tell all my, uh, you mentioned, you basically said what I tell every one of my patients. We're having this talk about the erythrocytosis, which is one of the risks of testosterone, if you call it a risk, but we still talk about it. Uh, but I'll tell them that, you know, if you want to go give blood to the Red Cross because you're a good guy and you just want to donate, then, then great for you. I mean, I think everything about that. But if you think you need to go donate blood because you're on testosterone, you don't. There's lots of worry and, and fear uh, out in the, in the forums and the TRT community about it. And it's, um, you know, I think every case is, is different. But in, in general, uh, I learned to just, after that episode of giving all the blood, you know, that was probably about, 10 more years ago, I just said, you know what, I'm, I'm doing fine. You know, I, I think I gave blood once just because it was a nice thing to do about four years ago. Well, when we measure their CBC, if they've got a hematocrit 54, 55, and you know, you'll tell them this is what it is, this is what it's from, it's from the testosterone, it's with the testosterone. but if this number makes you uncomfortable, go donate. Yeah. Go donate if you're uncomfortable with that. And because the opposite is if you have low testosterone, you're more likely to have anemia anyway. So it's actually a good thing that it increases erythropoietin and increases red. Oh. 
so yeah okay one last point before we end this guys um Okay, we see a lot of discussion in the fitness community about natural or not taking steroids or not. This is the so-called natty debate. So my question to you as hormone optimization experts, is someone taking testosterone replacement therapy to get his levels up to the upper limits of normal still natural uh, if he's compared to other guys performing resistance training, powerlifting or other kinds of uh, fitness? What's your take to that, kid? <laughs> Well, uh, you know, from an athletic performance standpoint, I understand why they why they would uh, consider that not natural. So I would have to it would give somebody an edge. So uh, so you're not natural any longer. Although I, don't, I do not consider it a you know it wasn't just, you know your anabolic your powerful anabolic steroids are all derivatives of testosterone, much more powerful derivatives. So that uh, I guess you cannot consider yourself a natty if you're on testosterone, even if it's therapeutic medical testosterone. Yeah. But being natural is becoming old, sick, and... Uh... Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, I've been on testosterone for, what, 23 years now, and I couldn't hit a, a baseball or, or play rugby, or you know, I don't have the skill of winning an Olympic medal. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I've got good reflexes there sometimes, so tough <laughs> drops, I can grab it. But overall, it doesn't make you into an uh, Olympian. You have to have certain skill and practice that goes behind it. And yeah, maybe the testosterone helps you helps you a bit. But I mean, you be whoever you want to be at the end of the day. If testosterone makes you feel better, it relieves your symptoms, it improves the quality of life. I don't think it should look be looked at through the prism of athletic performance as much as um, life extension, in the sense that you know, we know that testosterone enhances the, the release of uh, telomerase which lengthens the telomeres. So that's a, almost an anti-aging benefit. And if that it does translate into better quality of life and less disease as you get older, that's, that's very beneficial. And it shouldn't just be looked at as, oh, you're, you're not natural. Uh, you, can see, you can see where the conflict, you know, right? I, I see it and I understand their argument, but the point is, is they're not focused on what you just talked about, Mike. They're not focused on the longevity issues. They're not, they're not focused on what we're focused on, which is increasing the health span which is that period of your life where you're free of illness, you know, and you're, out, and you're, and you're still functioning, or you're fully functional. That's what we're trying to do, maintain the health span. And, uh, and that's why we do it. Of course, when they look at Steven, look at how muscular and shape he is for a 40 year old man. I mean, they, they think, well, man, he's, uh, he's on steroids. Well, he's on testosterone, but he's doing it for a, a, bit, a much different reason that somebody would do for a bodybuilding purpose. It's, 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 he's focused on health not necessarily physique that just comes along with it with hard work diet and exercise yeah and he's got great genes as well as all of the other things in place right i think you've seen one of your old videos Steve, yeah. where you know you do all the right things at the diet and exercise obviously but you said that your granddad had like really similar genes to you right yeah yeah i have the i have the the good genes for that exactly <laughs> Well, then again, it's not natural to take any medication like antibiotics. So if you don't take them, you just die when you have an infection, right? Yeah, I, I, whenever I have a skeptical patient in the office, I would always ask them this. And you look at their medication list, they're on some medications. Most people come in on medication. Would you agree with that, Mike and Sam? Yeah. So they're, so they're not. So they're not yeah, probably not as much as the US, but usually right. something. Yeah. But they're not adverse to, to taking some medication. But if you told them that, hey, this pharmacy, this pharmaceutical rep just came in and They detailed me on this pill right here. And this pill is going to decrease your subcutaneous and visceral body fat, which is going to decrease your risk of at least 13 different cancers. It's going to improve your sex drive. It's going to help improve your ED. It's going to increase your bone mineral density. It's going to increase your lean muscle mass, improve your cognition, decrease your depression, help protect against Alzheimer's disease. Would you take it? Would you take it? And they all look at me, well, well yeah, I would take it. Well, it's testosterone. It's called testosterone. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's, yeah. Why big, that's why big pharma hates it. But if big pharma put it out on a pill and named it something else, everybody would take it. Everybody mm -hmm. would take it. Yeah. Okay. This should end the nutty debate. <laughs> Okay, then we're through all the questions, guys. Um, thank you so much, Danny Bossa, for answering all the other questions. Uh, he did uh, 50 questions or more probably in the chat box, all for us. So he filtered it and he answered with all the knowledge he already got. So thank you for that. Okay, before we end this, uh, maybe one more thing. I got a question uh, for Balance My Hormones. Do you have any partners in Germany? Uh, we're always looking for more partners, uh, doctor partners and um we, we do help pay, uh, patients, our clients in Germany. We've got 
uh, lots of clients in Germany as well. So, um, with it, yeah. So, they, yeah, they can contact us and, you know, we have, we have... How do they do that? Just contact us through the website, balancemyhormones.co.uk, or they can call the main number on the site as, yeah, you as can, well. Yeah, you can just give them a ring, and you know, give us a ring or, or drop us a message and you get through to one of the members of staff. And they can we have, have doctors both in Europe and the UK, so we're Brexit-proof. Uh, as well as pharmacy, so we don't know what's going to happen with the hard Brexit, but in any case, we, um, we, we're covered. Okay, Keith, uh, maybe shortly explain to end how people can work with you. Just so you can uh, contact us at wellness at tier1hw.com. So okay. Okay. Hey guys, great work. I'm impressed with what you do. With, you know, with, I'm impressed with what you do with what little you got to work with, so keep up the good work. Thanks, thanks, Keith. We appreciate it. Appreciate it was that. a lot coming from you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, the United States and the UK. All right. Mike Always and Sam. Good friends. All right, new friends. Always good to make new friends. Yeah, for sure. And Mike and Sam, I'll talk to you live uh, soon in London next week. Okay, look forward yeah. to it. See you next See week. You soon. Okay, bye-bye, guys. Bye, Keith. Good evening. Take care, guys. Bye.